John chapter 3. We continue our series, Secure Forever. <clears throat> After today, unless Jesus comes back, uh, we, are, uh, we have one more week uh, in this series. Today, though, we are going to be looking at something that I think is incredibly important. Uh, we are going to be focusing on the failure of Christians. The failure of Christians. Now, uh, part of the reason I believe that people have embraced, and there's many reasons. Let me put it that way. There's many reasons. People have embraced this false teaching of the perseverance of the saints or Calvinism or lordship salvation. It's all the same, by the way. It's all the same. Uh, the, one of the reasons is because of the uh, deplorable lives that many Christians live. Uh, in that gives the other side, you might say, those who believe in salvation by works to some extent, gives them ammunition against us. And, and uh, yet at the same time, the fact that Christians fail and fail miserably is no reason to adopt false doctrine. All right? Now, we began this series talking about the elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room is this this false teaching that if you're saved, you're automatically going to serve the Lord. And if you don't automatically serve the Lord, you're not saved. But no one, has, no one ever gives any concrete ideas on, okay, so what then constitutes, at what point do you know this or that, or whether you're saved or not, or whether you're not saved, and, and all this. And of course, it not only produces doubt in an individual's life, but what it does is it creates a whole new breed of Pharisees. Now, listen, <clears throat> if you've trusted Jesus Christ the Savior, <clears throat> God saves you, he knows you're saved. So this idea of, well, you have to prove you're saved, who are you proving you're saved to exactly? Are you proving it to God? Well, doesn't he already know? I mean, he looks at the heart, right? By the way, not the outward appearance. He looks at the heart. Are you trying to prove it to yourself? Well, God wants you to simply believe what he says. And if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, he gives you eternal life. Are you trying to prove it to others? Well, listen, as I mature in life, you get to the point where the truth of it is you don't care what other people think of you. So just forget that one, okay? Take that by faith and just move on. <laughs> Because as you, you'll see that it, you can't please all of the people all the time. Really, you can't please most of them most of the time. Does Scripture, do the, does the Word of God give us any examples that the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints is a false doctrine? Are there any examples to prove against it? Well, the truth of it is, yes, there are. And we're going to look at some of those today. And we're going to be on a rapid pace. So I want you to hold on, strap, strap in your seatbelt, okay, or buckle your seatbelt, and let's get going. John chapter 3, verse 16, kind of takes care of everything. Unfortunately, people aren't, aren't satisfied with John 3.16 anymore. Um, John 3.16 kind of tells it the way it is. It says this, For God so loved the world, that includes everyone. That includes everyone. Okay? It doesn't say, For God so loves the elect of the world. You're adding to the word of God. Just believe what the Bible says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We know the son of God is Jesus. God gave Jesus to die on the cross, make the full payment for our sin, and come back from the dead. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, whosoever of what? Well, just look at the way it's constructed. Those of the world. Whosoever in the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him. Doesn't say believes and is baptized, believes and makes promises, believes and is good, believes and tries hard, believes and perseveres to the end. Nope. Whosoever believeth in him. Two promises. You shall not perish, you won't go to hell, but you have everlasting life. Now, when we trust Jesus Christ as our Savior, we are saved forever, no matter what we do. If you have trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, you're saved forever, no matter what you do. Why? Well, one reason is because eternal life is eternal. 
If God gives you everlasting life, then how are you going to undo that? If you can undo it, it's no longer everlasting. Therefore, it's not true because God says it is. Not only that, but all of our sins were taken care of by the payment Jesus made on the cross. Now, if all my sins have been taken care of through the payment Jesus made on the cross, I trusted in him that he made that payment for me. That payment was put to my account. That's called imputation. That payment was put to my account. Therefore, all my sins are taken care of for my entire life. Then what exactly is going to keep me out of heaven? Not a thing. So I have everlasting life. I'm saved. All my sins are paid for. There's nothing to keep me from living with God for all eternity. Therefore, I'm saved no matter what. No matter what? No matter what. Now, we as believers, those of us who have trusted Christ as Savior, should, once we are saved, live our lives for Christ. But whether we succeed or not, according to the Bible, we are still saved. This is the Word of God, okay? And it doesn't matter who teaches against that or contrary to it. God is always right, and if man disagrees with God, man is always wrong. That's just the way it is. So let's understand that. There is too much politics today, folks, in Christendom, okay? Well, this this doctrine must be true. Why? Well, because Dr. So-and-so said it. What about Dr. Jesus? Doesn't he have the final say? I think he does. Matter of fact, I know he does. See, but the false teaching of perseverance says that if you're saved, you are automatically going to go on and serve the Lord. And by the way, you're going to remain faithful. Now, you may have some ups and downs along the way, they'll say. And I like to say, well, how many? And they'll say, well, let's move on. Let's talk about something else. But see, the false teaching of perseverance of the saints says that if you are saved, you will serve Christ, and if you don't, you were never saved to begin with. As a matter of fact, some of them will be even so bold as to say, if you don't serve Christ, you'll lose salvation at the end. Now, that's a civil war in itself within Calvinism. And I know some people say, well, that wouldn't be Calvinism, that would be Arminianism. Well, let me get them really mad Arminianism and Calvinism are almost the exact same thing. Matter of fact, they are the same thing if you boil it down. See, the Arminians believe you you believe in Christ, but you have to live a faithful life to make it. Calvinists say you believe in Christ, but you you if you don't live a faithful life, you'll never have it, you know, or you never had it. Both of them are looking at man's works as the ultimate issue of whether you go to heaven or not. Both of them are false. You are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Someone I already quoted in this series, uh, J.I. Packer, in his book Concise Theology, which is a quote-unquote classic, says this, the doctrine, perseverance of the saints, declares that the regenerate are saved through persevering in faith, and Christian living to the end. He said that. Okay? That is false. Nothing against the man personally. I don't even know him. I've seen pictures of him before. Seems like a nice guy by his pictures. John Piper, very popular here in Minnesota, quote, there are many warnings in Scripture that those who do not hold fast to Christ can be lost in the end. Unquote. Folks, this is just not true. It doesn't matter who said it. If it disagrees with God, it's false. Okay? This is false teaching. It is, in fact, works for salvation. Now, <clears throat> if what I am saying is true, then most likely there would be examples in Scripture to support the sad fact that many believers do not go on and live for Christ as they should, as they should. In fact, there are many examples in the Bible of believers who didn't go on and look or and live for live for Christ. Excuse me. We're going to look at several examples of that today. Our first example is going to be somebody in the Old Testament. His name was Lot. His name was Lot. Now, 
Too many scriptures to cover today on this. I'm just going to give you a, a summary of kind of what happened in his life, and I'm going to point you. If you look at your study sheet, there's a lot of scriptural references on there. We can't cover them all today. But I'm going to point you to passages. And when you're dealing with Lot, go ahead and study his life. Genesis chapter 13 through Genesis chapter 19. Genesis 13 through Genesis 19. All right? By looking at the life of Lot, looking at the life of Lot. See, that's what this perseverance of the saints bit is all about. Looking at the life of somebody. Okay. If you're going to look at the life of Lot, many would be tempted to conclude that Lot was not a believer because his lifestyle was so deplorable. How could any believer be so worldly and be so perverse? This would have to be the conclusion of most people who believe in the false doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. They would have to look at Lot and say, there's no way that guy was saved. I mean, look at the life he lived. I know he was Abraham's nephew, but no way he was saved because look at his life. Yet the Bible is clear that Lot was a believer. Did you know that? You might say, where does it say that? I'm just excited you asked. Second Peter chapter 2. Uh, Second Peter 2. Turn there with me. Now, unfortunately, and, and I love the King James Bible, okay, but unfortunately, here's one of those cases where they didn't get it wrong. I think they could have made it clearer. So what they have is not wrong. It's just, you know, and they didn't write it for us today in the 21st century. They wrote it for folks back then who had a better handle on the English language, by the way, than we do today. Ain't that right? <laughs> Second Peter 2, it's, it's talking about uh, the, uh, obviously, uh, um, judgment. And it says here in 2 Peter 2, verse 7, and delivered just Lot vexed with the filthy conversation or lifestyle of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Now you might say, well, it's just saying in verse 7, it just Lot was the only one who was delivered. No, no, no. See, that's where the issue comes in. The word just there is the same word as we see in verse 8 twice where it says righteous. It's the exact same Greek word. Okay? You could read completely clear. As a matter of fact, some other translations has it this way. And delivered righteous lot. That's what they say. And delivered righteous lot. Now, wait a minute. If you look at his life, he was anything but righteous. You might say, well, there were things going on inside of them. Uh-huh. And there's a lot of things going on inside of a lot of people, folks. And guess what? There's not one of us who can see it. Not one of us. For that righteous man dwelling among them. Righteous? What do you mean he was righteous? He was righteous positionally. He was righteous in that he had put his faith in the Messiah who would come as a payment for sin. Let me point out several biblical truths about Lot. And again, we don't have time to cover all these. I, I wish we had the time, but we don't. But I'll just give them to you. And if you study Genesis 13 through 19, you'll see them. Number one is this. He was a believer. Now we see that here. Peter is the one who tells us. You wouldn't know it by reading Genesis, but you know it by reading Peter. He was a believer. Secondly, he was carnal. He was fleshly and loved worldly things, even though they convicted him. Remember, the, uh, they had too much cattle and uh, too, too many sheep and so forth, and, and, and Abraham said, pick which way you want to go. You want to go this way, you want to go that way. Whichever one you don't pick this is the way I'll go. And what did he do? He looked and he, he saw it, and he set his eyes on Sodom the area of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, folks, listen, they knew what that area was about. It was a filthy, morally filthy area of sexual perversion. And it said, in, in one part of, in, in the Genesis account, it says, and he was, he, he was close to Sodom. Then later on, he was inside, he was living inside of Sodom. 
Don't you think that's interesting? You think a believer would want to get as far away from that as possible. By the way, that's, this is the whole reason why homosexuality today and that perverse lifestyle is called sodomy. It got its name from the Genesis account. Did you know that? He was carnal and loved worldly things even though they convicted him. He was a miserable failure as a parent. A miserable failure. How do you know that? Because of what his daughters did. Which leads us to that last one. He offered his daughters up to others to be sexually abused. The sexual deviance came when he had visitors who happened to be angels. And they came and sundown came. I won't go into a lot of detail, but he said, hey, we, wanna, we, we want the men inside there because we want to commit perverse acts with them. And he was so embarrassed And by the way, that's why I had him get inside before sundown. He was so embarrassed that he said, take my daughters instead. Hey, my wife and I have three daughters. I would be a worthless piece of trash if I was to offer them up to be sexually abused. That's exactly what Lot did. That's exactly what he did. And yet the Bible tells us he was a believer. He had put his faith in the Lord. He offered his daughters up to others to be sexually abused and then got drunk by them and committed incest with them. I won't go into details. I'm just giving you the biblical record, folks. Righteous man? He was a righteous man? Well, God knew his heart. And he had put his faith in the Messiah who would come. Now let me just mention this before we move on to our next case. One, if perseverance were true, Lot would have never lived this way. Never. If perseverance was true, he would have never lived this way because according to the false doctrine of perseverance, real Christians do not practice sin. And yet he did. Excuse me. And he did it over and over and over again. He was living in Sodom. He was was adopting the the thinking, the philosophy. He was raising his family there. Uh, Listen, folks, we're not talking about New York City. There was a lot of areas he could have gone. Why was he attracted to that? And don't tell me he saw it as a mission field. No, they saw him as a mission field. Obviously, perseverance is false, but it goes further. Number two, there is no record in Scripture that Lot ever came back to the Lord. No record in Scripture. In other words, he was a backslidden believer for the rest of his days. This completely goes against the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. Completely goes against it. What do they do with that? Our second example, Saul. King Saul, okay? Um, 1 Samuel chapter 10, verses 1 through 13. There's a lot of scriptures. We're not going to cover them all. Saul was, a lot of you know this, he was the first king of Israel. Even though the Lord wanted to be their king, he allowed Saul to be their king. As a matter of fact, God directed Samuel to anoint Saul as king. It was the will of God, in that sense, to do so. In 1 Samuel 10, there are many characteristics Saul had that pointed to the fact that he was a believer. It's amazing to me, because a lot of people say, well, Saul wasn't a believer. And you know why they say he wasn't a believer? Listen to me. Because of what he did. There's more evidence, if you're going to look at the life, there's more evidence of things that happened to him and God's hand being on him than a lot of Old Testament saints. That he was, in fact, a believer. 1 Samuel 10, verse 1 Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his, Saul's head, and kissed him and said, uh, Is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance, referring to Israel? The Lord anointed Saul. 
Why in the world would God anoint a lost person over his chosen people? No, I don't think so. Jump down to verse 6. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee. This is Samuel talking to Saul. And thou shalt prophesy with them and shall be turned into another man. Doesn't that sound like something spiritual's going on there? And let it be when these signs are come unto thee that thou uh, do, as occasion, uh, do as occasion serve thee. For God is with thee. God is with thee. Jump down to verse 9. And so it was that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart. And all those signs came to pass that day. God gave him another heart. Folks, we could list these. One, one, you know, write down. One, two, three, four. Write down a list. All the things that happened in the life of Saul. There's no reason to believe he was not a believer. There's no reason. But he was a poor example of a believer. See, instead of being the king that he should be, he failed in his duties. And when David came onto the scene, who was obedient to the Lord, Saul was filled with jealousy. As a matter of fact, it became the, it became the uh, 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 controlling factor of his life till the day he died. This led to one wrong decision after another, and this destroyed his life. Not only that, but he was very careless with the truths of God, which he knew, but he was very careless with them. He wouldn't obey fully, but only in what he wanted to do. And you look at his, his uh, life and you see that. Now in 1 Samuel 15, I want you to look at this. 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 23, after he had, there had been major rebellion in his life, really it was not the only time. There had been many times before that. But Samuel Samuel declares this to him. He's talking to Saul about Saul. And he says this, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. By the way, parents, you remember that the next time your children are rebelling. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. And his life just went downhill from there. See, Samuel could not have been more direct. Saul was rebellious and Saul was stubborn. And yet, Saul was a believer. His life continued to deteriorate until his pathetic death. Now, this is certainly not the picture of a persevering, victorious, spiritual believer. But if perseverance of the saints is true, that's exactly what he would have been. He wouldn't have gotten worse. He would have gotten better. But he never did. Life fell apart for him. The details of his pathetic death are recorded in 1 Samuel 31 and also 1 Chronicles 10. Now, for the record, I want you to turn with me to 1 Samuel 31. Very important passage, folks. 1 Samuel chapter 31. Here he is, the end of his life. There's trouble up ahead. It's been declared. He's in a battle. And in 1 Samuel 31, verse 3, it says, And the battle went sore against Saul. Now remember why we're covering this. Is perseverance of the the saints true? No. Are there any examples of believers who did not persevere to the end, therefore proving that perseverance of the saints is true? Yes. Lot is one. And by the way, there's more than what we're covering today. Lot is one. Saul is another one. The battle went sore against Saul, and the archers hit him, and he was sore wounded, very much wounded of the archers. Then said Saul unto his armor bearer, Draw thy sword and thrust me through therewith, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was sore afraid. Watch this. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell upon it. He killed himself. He killed himself. 
Saul's life ends in tragedy. He commits suicide. This is the most pathetic death for any believer. It's a very sad thing, folks. But nevertheless, he did it, okay? First Chronicles chapter 10 and verse 13, it says, So Saul died with, uh, for his transgression, which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not, and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit, the witch of Endor, to inquire of it. So what do we see? We see Saul dying because of his sin. We see Saul committing suicide. We see Saul going through his life controlled by jealousy and paranoia against David. And yet he was a believer. Doesn't sound like perseverance of the saints to me. Saul did not persevere into the end, yet he was clearly a believer. He did not die in faith. He died in sin and disgrace. The last act of his life was a sin, so much for persevering to the end. He killed himself. He died in sin for suicide, which is murder, is a sin. Again, this completely breaks down the false doctrine of perseverance. As we've already seen, those who teach perseverance tell us that you can only stray so far for so long And then if you're really saved, you're going to come back to the Lord in the end and get it all squared away before you die. Because all true believers, they say, die in faith. By the way, perseverance of the saints is a major tenet of Calvinism. It's the fifth of the tulip. And it's simply false. Saul was a believer, yet never did return to the Lord. And the last act of his life was a sin. How do you reconcile that with this false teaching of the perseverance of the saints? The elephant's almost out of the room. He's halfway through the door, but he's kind of stuck. Okay, let's help him through. Go with me to 1 Corinthians. Number three, the church at Corinth. We've looked at two Old Testament examples, and there are many more. Let's look at a New Testament example, the church at Corinth. The third example of believers who did not persevere is the church at Corinth. This church was simply infested with many problems. Before we go into details, let's first understand the culture and the people who made up the church, okay? The, the, uh, the city of Corinth was a giant melting pot of, of cultures with many religions and philosophies. Even their religions were perverse, and immoral. There, there were more than a dozen pagan temples in the city of Corinth. These temples, as part of their worship, employed at least a thousand prostitutes. This is part of their worship. Corinth's reputation was such that prostitutes in other cities began to be called Corinthian girls. That's how perverse Corinth was. The name Corinthian came to mean to practice fornication. It became synonymous in its usage. What a reputation the city had. Yet there were people who put their faith in Jesus Christ as Savior at the preaching of the gospel, and a church began. These are believers Paul is writing to. Now, the problem was this. They had so much of the world in their system that once they were saved, a lot of it remained. Now, you might say, well, how can that be if they're saved? Well, because remember, we've already covered the two natures. When you trust Christ, you're born with a sin nature, but when you trust Christ, God gives you a new nature. But the sin nature's still there. And there's a battle between the spirit and the flesh, the spirit nature and the, uh, the sin nature, or the new nature and the sin nature. And so there's a battle there. Well, which one wins? Whichever one you yield to and obey and live according to, that's the one that wins. But as we've seen, the false teaching of perseverance, there are many tenets of it who, who say, well, if you, not all, but many of them, if you're saved, really, it, you don't have a sin nature anymore. You only have the new nature now. That's what John MacArthur teaches. You don't have two natures. You only have one. You only have one. That's false. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 1, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God 
Now, the word of is genitive. Do we understand that, genitive? It means belongs to. Belongs to. When you say genitive case, it means that whatever it is that belongs to somebody. The church of God. This church belonged to who? God. These are believers, which is at Corinth. To them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Save people. Called to be saints. Literally called saints to be as italicized. With all that in every place, call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. You might say, well, these are saved people. Man alive, I bet they were godly. <laughs> Folks, they were anything but godly. As a matter of fact, they were a disgrace to grace. They were a disgrace to grace. How deplorable were these believers, you may ask? Well, let's look briefly at some of their problems. I've given you the passages. We cannot cover them because of time. You can look them up on your own and study this through. Let me just go through them quickly. We'll go through in, in, uh, in numeric order. One, there were divisions in the church over following different people instead of Christ. Some followed Paul, some Apollo, some Peter. Some said, we're more, we're more spiritual than you. We follow Jesus. Okay? They were carnal. Secondly, uh, that's 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 13. Secondly, they were impressed with worldly wisdom instead of true spirituality. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 20, 21, and 25. It was a big deal. Worldly credentials, not spiritual ones, were what impressed them. Three, they were not growing in grace as they should. Paul said they were spiritual babies. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, spiritual babies. Now, wait a minute. I thought if you're saved, you automatically go on and serve the Lord. No, he said they were carnal. You know, there are people who teach there's no such thing as a carnal Christian. By the way, most of them are Calvinists. Number four, they were living according to the flesh or the old nature. Again, they were carnal, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. Number five, they were being judgmental towards Paul and judging his motives for why he did what he did, his service. That's found in 1 Corinthians 4, verses 3 through 5. Number six, they were proud. Paul called them on several occasions, puffed up. That means proud, inflated. I like to use the term, they were legends in their own mind. Okay? 1 Corinthians 4, 6, and 18 through 19. Number seven, they were callous to sin in their church. There was open sin in their church. They didn't do anything about it. As a matter of fact, they were proud of it. There was open vile sin that they did nothing about. I believe it was a case of incest going on. Now, some people say, well, no. That, you know, we won't go into the details there. I think it was. And they weren't doing anything about it. They were proud of their tolerance. And this is certainly no attitude for even one saint to have. Yet alone, a whole church full. But they wouldn't do anything about it. Number eight, they were immoral. And that's brought out very clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 13. Number nine, they did not practice biblical church discipline. 1 Corinthians 5, 3 through 7. They would not get rid of the man who was living this way. They were tolerant. Sound familiar? Sound familiar? Number 10, they were taking each other to court and mistreating one another. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. No reason for another Christian to take another Christian to court. There's no reason. Okay? Things should be able to be settled in um, five minutes. Things should be able to be settled between Christians. Number 11, they were abusing their liberty in Christ and making others stumble. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 9 through 13. Number 12, they were critical of Paul, the very one who had led many of them to the Lord. 1 Corinthians 9, 1 through 5. Number 13, they were coming to the Lord's Supper drunk. 
drunk. Let me tell you something. Usually on the first Sunday of each month, we have the Lord's Supper on Sunday night, first Sunday night. If any of you show up drunk, you'll be asked to leave the church out that night. You'll be asked to, to leave that night and go out of the building. Okay? Glad to help you overcome it. That's why we have an addictions program. Glad to help you overcome it. But don't come in here to observe the Lord's Supper and come in drunk. You'll be escorted out of the building. We're, not, we're not just not going to put up with that. Okay? Well, you're a meanie. I'm going to write you a letter. Go ahead. Doesn't matter. Okay? It's a disgrace according to 1 Corinthians 11. Paul was not patting them on the back. He was rebuking them because of their lack of action. Number 14, along with that, they were being irreverent at the Lord's Supper and acting in a frivolous way. 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 29. Number 15, they were misusing the spiritual gifts that God had given them. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through 14. Misusing their spiritual gifts. And number 16, they were questioning truths concerning the doctrine of bodily resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 17. You get the picture? <laughs> now, these 16 problems could be subdivided and added to and are in no way exhaustive, but I think we get the picture. The Corinthians believers were a divided, carnal, selfish, immoral, arrogant, twisted church, and yet these were saved people. They're saved. How silly to say, well, if you're saved, you'll automatically love the Lord and serve him. Well, these people were saved, and they were being a disgrace to the grace of God that saved them. It Was it good? No, it wasn't good. That's why Paul's writing them. The very one who was the champion of preaching salvation by grace is telling them, you guys are pathetic. But he begins the letter by recognizing the fact that they were saved. They were so carnal and uncooperative, by the way, that something very severe is recorded for us in chapter 11. And I want you to go there on this one. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we're going to begin in verse 27. And here it is, folks, because of their irreverence at the Lord's Supper, God made some of them physically sick, and not only that, he even struck some of them dead. See, be believing in salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, does not mean that sin is not sin. What it means is that we have a solution to our sin, and it's found in Christ. And God has called every child of God to live a godly life. Now, whether we succeed or fail at that, it does not change the fact that if you're saved, you're saved, period. But God takes this seriously. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty seven. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord, talking about communion unworthily in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation or judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. That word sleep there is used for believers as those who have died physically, but have gone on to be with the Lord. He says, you guys were making a mockery of the Lord's Supper. I, got, I made some of you sick, and I actually took some of you home. Where did he take them? Home. They didn't go to hell. They went to heaven. You might say, well, that doesn't seem fair to me. It's not a matter of fairness. It's a matter of grace. We're saved by grace. We're saved by undeserved favor. Undeserved, un, 
merited, okay? Now, folks, this is a far cry from the portrait that the teachers and the proponents of perseverance doctrine paint of what every Christian will be if they are truly, quote-unquote, saved. I, hey, imagine what churches would be like if everybody who was saved automatically lived for Christ. Man, it'd be heaven on earth, right? But the truth of it is, as we've already seen in our series, man has a free will. He has the ability to choose, and a lot of the times he makes wrong choices. Truth of it is, every time we sin, we make a wrong choice, don't we? Because it's never God's will. Yet these people in Corinth were saved. Yet they did not persevere to the end, but rather they died in sin. That's important. God took their lives. They didn't persevere to the end. He took some of their lives. The truth is, many of these believers had committed what the Bible talks about, sin unto death. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 16. There is a sin unto death. In other words, a Christian can sin a sin where God says, that's it. You're coming home. You're coming home. I know that people, Christians, that has happened to. Okay? Or at least it would seem that way. Now let me just throw in a couple bonus characters for you today, okay? What about Demas? Oh, I wish I, listen, I could spend the whole service on, on Demas. Demas, companion missionary with the Apostle Paul for many years. He was a faithful, faithful, faithful believer. Companion with Luke, the physician, Timothy. Man, they were a ministry team, and they did, they, they, they scaled the mountains of Asia Minor and did unbelievable things for Christ and lived and yet it says in 2 Timothy 4, verse 9, Paul says, Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved agape, love, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, Titus to Demalcia. Listen, folks, he was a saved man. There's no question about it. Don't you think Paul would have known whether he was saved or not? going years in ministry, traveling Asia Minor, going to churches, being persecuted, robbed, beaten, and all these kind of things. And yet what happened to him? He fell in love with the world system, and he quit the ministry. No record in Scripture that he ever got squared away. The last one I want to just throw in for free, this is a big bonus. What about Solomon? Solomon. You ever studied the life of Solomon? You might say, well, he got straightened out. Oh, did he? You know, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of confusion about this man's life. I can tell you this, though. The Bible is clear. Uh, look with me to 1 Kings chapter 11. Well, yeah, you know, he had the 700 wives and, and the 300 concubines. Can you imagine? Now, don't imagine for too long on that, okay? What a mess! What a mess. Well, yeah, but you know what? He got straightened out later in life. No, friend. The Bible is clear that the 700 wives and concubines didn't come until he was older. Did you know that? 1 Kings 11, 4, it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. The Bible not only says that he had, a, he had this problem in his life, you can call it an addiction if you want, I don't know how you want to term this, 700 wives and 300 concubines, there's a problem there, Okay. But the Bible even tells us that he ended up adopting the false worship of his wives. He even sacrificed the false gods. The truth is, all of these people mentioned and more practiced sin, and many of them died because of the sin they practiced. Listen, the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints is a false teaching and it is everywhere today, and it is ruining Christians and ruining churches. 
And we need to stand up and call it what it is and turn our eyes and hearts back to the clear teaching of the Word of God. Let me close over in Ephesians chapter 2. Would you go there with me? God is so clear, crystal clear. It's like the ringing of a beautiful bell on a clear winter's morning that you hear across the canyon, across the valley, that beautiful, clear sound. It's like, man, this is beautiful. Yes, the gospel is beautiful. That's why it's called good news. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says, For by grace are you saved. God's unmerited favor or kindness. For by grace are you saved through faith. Not faith in faithfulness, not faith in perseverance, not faith in baptism, giving money, anything. No good works. For by grace are you saved through faith in Christ. And that not of yourselves. You're not saved of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Isn't that simple? It's a gift. Verse 9 says, It is not of works lest any man should boast. Not of works, not of works, not of works. So anybody says you have to be faithful to the end, what are they saying? You have to do good works. The Bible says it's not of works. The perseverance of the saints is lordship salvation. Lordship salvation is a false gospel. A false gospel. And folks, let me say this. If you believe that your good works have part of getting you to heaven, you are lost. You're lost. You're not going to get to heaven by trusting in your works. The only way you're going to get to heaven is by trusting in Jesus Christ. Look up here if this hand represents you and me and my wallet, our sin. God loves us. He hates our sin. You see, we're separated from God because of that. Heaven's perfect. To get there, you have to be perfect, and none of us are. God says our sins got to be paid for. He's a righteous God. If we were to do it, we'd be lost forever in hell, paying for it. But God says the wages of sin is death. That's the only payment is death. Not good works, not going to church, not giving money, not being baptized, not trying to keep the commandments, not trying to reform your life, stop sinning, start doing good things. Many of those things are good. They will not take away the sin. A death payment is the only payment for sin. But God so loved us, does not want us to be lost. He took on flesh, this hand representing Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. And when Jesus went to the cross, our sin, he took it all upon himself and he made the complete payment for it, leaving us nothing to pay for, and rose from the grave three days later. He says, if you will put your faith in him, he will save you by his grace. His grace. And once you're saved, you're saved forever because the kind of life he gives is only one kind that's everlasting. Isn't that good news? Isn't that a glorious message? That's a glorious message. If you believe that, you go out and live a wicked life. Well, you know, I was living a lot more wicked life before I believed this message than I am now. What happened? Grace the love of God, the Word of God, a new nature, the grace of God. If you respond positively to the grace of God that saves you, it'll change your life. It'll change your life. I'm talking to Christians. But friend, you can be saved by grace and live a defeated, carnal, wicked life. And you can still go to heaven. I don't advise it, but you can. Why? Because you're not saved by the way you live. You're saved by the payment Jesus made for you, whether you've trusted him as Savior or not. Let's all bow in prayer, shall we? With every head bowed today and every eye closed, please no one looking around. And the reason we do that, friend, is, is so you can be undistracted. I want to encourage you right now, right where you sit, if you've never trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior, would you trust in Him right now in the quietness of your mind? I've done the best I can today to explain this. Hopefully you're getting it. I don't want anybody here in this room or watching internet, whether live streaming or down the road, I don't want anyone to end up in hell 
because you've put your faith in yourself to some extent and not fully in Christ alone. Friend, he's the only way. Jesus himself said it. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes of the Father but by me. Will you please trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior? In the quietness of your mind right now, you can get that settled between you and God. Would you trust in Christ? Would you trust in Christ? Now, let me say, if you're here today in this service and it made sense to you today, and today you trusted Christ as Savior, could I pray for you as we close? In a moment, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand. You don't have to raise your hand. It doesn't save you. It's so that I can pray for you if you've trusted Christ today as your Savior. The only way you go to heaven is through faith in Christ. But I'd like to pray for you. I won't embarrass you in any way. I won't call you out. But is there anyone that today is the first time you understood it and today you trusted Christ the Savior? Could I pray for you as we close today? Just slip it up, put it down. Is there anyone? Say, I never understood this before. Today I trusted Christ as my Savior. Yeah, I'd like you to pray for me. Would you do that? I'd love to do that. Is there anyone? Just slip it up, put it down. Father, we are so grateful for salvation by grace. We are grateful, Father, that we're not saved by doing any good work of any kind. We're saved by believing in Jesus Christ as our Savior. And that you give us everlasting life and you break the promise we'll never come into condemnation, but we've already passed from death unto life when we believed. We thank you for that good news. And I pray, Lord, we see this today. Oh, this is such an issue. It's, a, it's the, probably one of the, the biggest issues today facing the church and humanity. I pray we'll all see it. Thank you for this day, Lord. Bless each one. Give everyone safe travels home today. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, that concludes this edition of Voice of Assurance. Thanks so much for listening. And would you share this ministry with a friend? To contact us or learn more about our ministry, please visit www.northlandchurch.com. Your prayers and support for this ministry are greatly appreciated. Thank you so much, and God bless you.